Recognize Umbra Walker D01. Recognize Artemis D07. Welcome to the cave, everyone, and welcome also to our third installment of Secret Origins. In this series, we'll be diving into the history of the main characters in Young Justice, heroes, supporting cast, and even villains. Today, we're exploring the history of Artemis, aka Tigress, aka Huntress. It's impossible to talk about one without all the others, so let's dive in. Dad, he must have done this. Another of his stupid tests. What kind of test? He probably wants me to kill you. The first appearance in DC Comics of a character named Tigress was in Action Comics number one in February of 1938. That Tigress had no secret identity, but was a regular enemy of Zatara, Zatanna's father. And this Tigress was created by Fred Gardner. The first appearance of Paula Brooks who in the Young Justice TV series is Artemis's mother, was as the Huntress in Sensation Comics number 68, August 1947, and as Tigress with her reintroduction in Young All-Stars number 6 in 1987, 40 years later. The Huntress character was created by Mort Meskin, and the Tigress version was created by Roy Thomas. The first appearance of Artemis Croc was in Infinity Incorporated number 34, January 1987, created by Roy Thomas and Todd McFarlane. So when we're talking about origin stories, we've got a whole family or stream of families that feed into the character of the Artemis that we see in the show. The original Tigress was the enemy of Zatanna's father, Zatara, appeared in a number of comics back in the 1930s and early 40s. There's not much we know about her at this point, so I think we're going to pass right past her. The most interesting part of her to my mind, is the fact that she was such an early character in DC Comics and one of the classic enemies of Zatanna. I honestly didn't know that Zatanna went back that far. We'll have to do some more research for the Zatara Secret Origins episode. So the character that starts getting into what we know of as the Young Justice versions of Tigress, Huntress, and Artemis is Paula Brooks. Paula Brooks became Paula Croc after she married Lawrence Crusher Croc, a.k.a. Sportsmaster. Paula Brooks was originally a member of the Young All-Stars under the name of Tigress. The Young All-Stars was a contemporary group to the better-known Justice Society. Paula was a reformed cat burglar who joined the team to make up for a criminal past, but she eventually returns to her criminal career under the name of Huntress. Of course, after marrying Sportsmaster, she had a daughter named Artemis. She appeared off and on uh, in periods of time with the Justice Society stories, which leads us to Artemis Croc. The comic version of Artemis started off as a criminal and stayed that way, was a member of both the Injustice Unlimited version of the Injustice Society and a member of Alexander Luther Jr., his uh, secret society of supervillains. She broke her parents out of Empire State Detention Center and joined forces with a number of villains and was key in the partially successful assassination attempts on several members of Infinity Incorporated. She eventually took on the name Tigress, but originally simply went by the name Artemis, just like in Young Justice. After taking on the name of Tigress, she partnered at times with Icicle Jr. on a number of missions against Justice Society members, and strangely enough, the two eventually married and had a daughter. The Tigress Huntress character was a continuing villain of a number of Justice Society members, but the version of the character that's first linked to the Teen Titans didn't occur until the new 52 reboot of DC Comics back in 2011, which was, of course, around the time that Young Justice aired. The new 52 Artemis helped the Titans free a number of metahuman teenagers from the villain called Harvest, but she gets killed in the process. Her death helps to galvanize the Titans and also a group called the Legion of the Lost to work together to take down Harvest. That's pretty much all we know about Artemis. As old as this character is and this family is, I have to say, I knew almost nothing about this. When she appeared in the TV show, I assumed that Artemis was a new character that had been brought up simply for this kind of key link between Sportsmaster and the rest of the team. 
I was surprised to find out that she was a actual reoccurring character and, of course, went by the names of Tigress and Huntress and Artemis. There are some other characters named Artemis in the DC universe, including one of the Amazons on Wonder Woman's home island of Themyscira. But this character, oh man, such in the background. And we'll get into that in just a sec. So the power set of Tigress in the comics was pretty similar to the ones that we see on the show, except for the fact that she also had heightened senses, allowing her to track prey by smell. But in general, parallels who we see Artemis as in the show. A highly skilled martial artist, a skilled melee and ranged combatant. Of course, her training is focused on bows, both hand crossbows and compound bows and recurves. But she's seen, particularly in Season 2, to be skilled with other ranged weapons as well, including blowguns, and melee weapons, including swords, which makes sense considering her father must have trained her across the board and we see him being brutal with just about everything. Of course, in her repertoire includes trick arrows as well, including explosive arrows, arrow nets, trackers, high-density polyurethane foam used to restrain villains, mostly that have enhanced strength, bolas, and much more. Where she got the training with the arrows before she met Green Arrow, we don't know. As far as we know, she joined the team (laughs) days after being discovered by Batman and Green Arrow right after she had tracked the Young Justice team and saved Wally from Amazo. So these arrows could have been provided by Green Arrow before she joined the team, but it takes some training to use these arrows to compensate for how they're weighed, to know where they are in your quiver, etc., etc., which makes me think that maybe her father, Sportsmaster, had her set up, or his intention may have been set up to make her a villainous parallel to Speedy or Green Arrow. So now that we've kind of gone over the history of the comics of this character, let's talk a little bit about this version we see in Young Justice. The version of Artemis here is an entirely new take on the character, yet also manages to hearken back to characters and storylines from DC history that that reaches back farther than Superman. This character is so relatively minor that I didn't even realize that I actually own comics with versions of her in it. And I didn't realize until I researched this episode. My guess is that the decision to use Sportsmaster as a major threat in Young Justice came before the decision to add Artemis to the team. I'd be interested to ask Greg Weissman or Brandon Bietti if that's actually true. My only reason for saying that is because this version of Artemis is so different in personality and, and where she goes and even where she comes from than any of her previous incarnations that it just seems odd. So many other DC characters could have been used or adapted to fit the role, the niche that Artemis fits in in the show. Yet once you decide to use Sportsmaster and you dive deeper into his history, like the creative team has done with all of the characters in the show, the idea to fold Huntress in and Artemis into the story is a brilliant one. The extra twist on top of that is tying Cheshire into this family as well. Jade Nguyen is a classic Titans villain and considered the second deadliest assassin in the DC universe behind only Lady Shiva, who even Batman has a significant respect for. Having Jade be a part of the show is really kind of almost a given seeing Cheshire's role in the history of the Titans and her comic book relationship to Arsenal, aka Roy. But she could have been a separate, unrelated, literally unrelated in this case, character to Artemis. And that's the way most shows would go. Because most shows don't take the time. They don't plan a show so broadly, so deeply, or for seasons-long payoffs. Or they don't have the same passion for the source material. Merging Jade's storyline with Artemis' storyline created a complex and interesting dynamic, not just for Artemis and their family, 
but across the entire show. It allowed the writers to tell a story about growing up and making your own choices about who you are and who you'll be despite your family's history. Artemis' story in Young Justice, it parallels the same coming-of-age experiences of Dick and Wally and Roy and McGann and Connor and Zatanna even, but each of those stories contains elements of real-life dynamics that watchers can identify with. Adoption in the case of Dick and dealing with relatively standoffish sorry Bruce, parent, living up to the hero-worshipping expectations that you put on yourself, like with Wally, who was the Flash's number one fan until he found out that Flash was actually his uncle and then gained his powers, the pressure he puts on himself, and when we see that in reflection of how he knows that he's not as fast and doesn't have the same powers as Flash in the show, that complex transition from child to adult peer that Roy goes through, the absence of role models in the case of Connor, the being raised by a single parent in the case of Zatanna, the need to be accepted, feeling alien, foreign, different in a group of people who can all relate to one another in the case of McGann, and with Artemis, dysfunctional families. Of all of those things, of all of those coming-of-age stories that we see in all of these other characters on the show, Artemis's story is the one that I think hits home with more people because of the fact that it's about something that so many, unfortunately, so many people can relate to. We get to see this Artemis, the young justice Artemis, make tough decisions about who she will become. In season two, we get to see her living a normal life or, you know, normal for a retired superhero anyway. She's happy despite the abuse that she experienced. That's, to me, to me, that's how Artemis is a hero in this show and explains why so many watchers identified with her so strongly. It's not about her powers. As I've said many times before, it's never about the powers. And in her case, it's not even the fact that she has no powers, although that made for some powerful, powerful moments in episodes like Homecoming. It's about what she chooses to be in her life, despite the challenges she had growing up. And it's just another example of why this show is so exceptional. Finding a way to incorporate the other aspects of this character's history into the show in ways that were so smooth, like her faking her own death to seal Aqualad's bond into the light, but then taking on another, another persona of Tigress or Huntress. It's amazing to me this callback to classic DC storylines, yet somehow manages to merge itself into this show. They managed to have echoes, Greg Weissman, Brandon Vietti, the, the, the showrunners, the writers, the directors, managed to fold these nods into the show in such an integral way, yet it never feels forced. And it's particularly impressive to me with Artemis because, honestly, I didn't know anything about her, as I mentioned. I don't know anything about this character. So in doing research for this episode and finding out that this Artemis Croc character had become a character named Tigress in the comics and that Huntress was an integral part of her history just continues to blow me away. Artemis was able to, as a character, broaden the diversity of the show in a number of different ways. I talked about the dysfunctional family aspect of it but also opening up the door for, honestly, some non-white characters. When we first see Artemis, she's blonde. She does have kind of those almond-shaped eyes, but we don't know much about her, about who she is until we at first meet her mom. And the first time we get a nod to who she might be, even though we know her first name, is when she gets that letter from the Gotham Academy accepting her. If you pause that, you'll see for the first time her name at the top of the page, Artemis Croc. If you know that her mom was Huntress and you know enough about Sportsmaster to know his last name and that he married Huntress, you could probably put these, these pieces together. And if you put those pieces together, 
what you'd know, even if you were hard, more hardcore than me, I guess, and know who this Artemis character is, you know that in the comics she's never been a hero, with that one exception of a very short period of time with the new 52 arc. She wasn't a hero, which means all of this discussion about a mole and who her parents were and what was going on could have evolved into the fact that Artemis was the mole. In addition to that, some classic Titan storylines involve this mole or betrayal story arc, the the most famous one being the Judas Contract, which was a brilliant four-issue miniseries we've talked about on the show in the past, and we'll talk about in the show, I'm sure, again in the future, where a character named Terra became a member of the team, but then ended up betraying the team. This could have been that story arc. So somehow the writers have created layer upon layer upon layer to even keep old school fans off balance as to who or what might be coming up next, yet still creating an organic show that made sense across an ensemble cast. And like with so many of the characters from Young Justice, particularly the core team in season one, we get to see this growth. And with what happens at the end of season two, we get to see Artemis get to see Artemis change her life again, become something else. See that growth arc from the very first episode that we see her in in Infiltrator to from that brash, that cocky, that confrontational, combative character who was raised to have to defend herself and not need or want to make friends to a hero in season two when she returns to the team and sees all the new team members looking at her, looking up to her as a hero and as someone that they want to be. And then at the end of season two with the loss that she suffers and what she has to decide to do from then on and giving Bart Allen impulse, the nod to continue Wally's legacy. There's a lot of things I want to see in a season three. One of the things that I want to see in season three is Artemis continuing to get her feet under her and to be who she needs to be. And of course, to see the return of Wally and see how that affects her or if it affects her or if they do let Wally return and see how that changes and how she reacts to it. So that's the story, the hidden and very long old story of Artemis, Tigress, Huntress, in DC Comics. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Secret Origins. Coming up next, one of the few heroes from any company who is happy and living his dream, Wally West as Kid Flash. You can get a hold of us at The YJ Files on Twitter, www.facebook.com slash crashing the mode, and by email at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. I also encourage you to link over to our website, www.crashingthemode.com, to check out links to some fantastic Artemis fan art and two AMVs in particular, including one to the song Paradise, created by Musical Chaos 05, and What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger by Bat of Wonder. As always, Please hashtag keep binging YJ on Netflix and join us for our next regular episode of the Young Justice Files. Stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.